All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. This is our 16th tale of the season. Uh, my name's Nikki. I'm the curator at the museum. And uh, I'd like to introduce Sarah Dawes, who's our collection coordinator for the summer. Nathaniel is on vacation. Those of you who got used to Nathaniel on the camera. So uh, Sarah's filling in this week. And uh, she also looks after all the artifacts at the museum. Um, our theme this year is Canada's 150th, so we're exploring Pemberton history through the context of Canada's 150th. And uh, our last one next week uh, is about flood control in Pemberton. It's called A Few Rivers Run Through It with Brendan McLeod. And that'll be our last one. Uh, the Diking District is 70 years old this year. It's uh, an anniversary year for them. So don't miss that one. Because then it's over until next year. Uh, we want to thank our Team Tail Bakers, our presenters, and uh, all of you for coming to the program. Thanks for your support. Today I'd like to welcome Eric Anderson, who's from Squamish. Uh, he's a local historian with Squamish and Norwegian roots. And he's involved with the Sea to Sky Forestry Center who we understand are moving forward with construction of a forestry interpretive center in Squamish. So we're excited to hear more about that. And Eric is no stranger to the Pemberton Museum. Uh, he's given us some wonderful presentations through the years, including the story of Emily Carr's trip by rail through the region. Uh, he also talked about the importance of the Pemberton Trail Highway 99 uh, transportation corridor as a critical corridor uh, that connects the interior to the coast. And last year, he told us about the Barber family, because Charles Barber was an early pioneer here. And uh, him and his brother Albert ran some logging operations in Squamish uh, in the late 1800s, turn of the century, some of the first logging shows. So today, Eric is presenting a tale of Pemberton in the World News, which is some original research about Pemberton using historic newspaper clippings. So, and he's also donating all of this to the museum. So thank you, Eric. And, uh, For future considerations. <laughs> yeah, we're always excited. We have a room full of fans. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. Yes, so one thing that is missing in my title is Canada 150, so I thought I should just make some acknowledgement about that and celebrating anniversaries and uh, mainly to observe that this wonderful Pemberton history book is now 40 years old and that's a really an anniversary to celebrate. It's been so durable, it's really a unique local history uh, achievement and uh, so uh, now 40 years old, it's hard to believe. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back to this book a little bit later. And only twenty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I am going to dare to cover the topic of Pemberton in world history, and uh, Pemberton history in the world. The world being a Vancouver newspaper that I'll be introducing shortly. Thank you. Newspapers are uh, something I've been giving a lot of thought to lately with my colleagues in our Forestry Center project in Squamish. Forest history in this corridor, a lot of it is in the old newspapers. And so we're taking great care to figure out orienting ourselves as to how to obtain uh, the information from newspapers. Where are they? Which archives are they held in? There's quite a number of them to work with, about half a dozen in this corridor. And uh, there are some challenges. Um, and one of the things that uh, we're noticing in projects, uh, local history projects, is how newspapers have changed over time. And an example of that for me comes, has come in during the course of writing a local theater history in Squamish, community theater, uh, 35 years of the House on Drama Club, which was also active here in Pemberton and collaborating with local Pemberton folks at various times between 1965 and 2000. And here is a collage of newspaper clippings and reviews from the 1960s. Now watch what happens in the 1970s. And now in the 1980s. Uh. Newspapers change over time. I'm going to go back again to the 1960s. And a lot of these people are writing detailed, print-heavy reviews. bona fide reviews. They have theater backgrounds, they're teachers or other types of professionals connected to the theater world. 
Unfortunately, few people find their way into our newspapers today. And I'll bet, although we have a thriving theater scene in Squamish, it's been a good 20 years since there was a decent review in the local newspaper. And that's not so much about the people, it's about how newspapers and their function have changed over time. So 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, we come to be heavy on photos and titling and less on real detailed and solid work on telling what's going on in this particular production. And we find that in uh, how newspapers cover many realms. Uh, recently, I've come to think about this forest fire situation we have in the interior this summer. And we pick up a copy of the Vancouver Sun, and it's borrowed some copy story from Washington, D.C., and some family plight down in Washington, D.C., which may or may not be interesting, but we've got all kinds of families having their own plights here in B.C. that we're not reading about in the Vancouver paper anymore. So newspapers are changing. We're in a bit of a transition. So the newspapers that I'm going to be focusing on are from earlier part of the 20th century for the most part. And, but I'd like to start with Pemberton in world history, as told in newspapers. That is Pemberton on the world stage. Pemberton as part of a worldwide international story. And I'm going to suggest there's at least nine such stories. I'm just giving examples where we can think about Pemberton in world history. Now I am going to channel the spirit of the Swedish Canadian uh, former longtime Pemberton resident, the late Slim Foberg, and I think he would approve. And uh, I did know him uh, for a little bit uh, some years ago in uh, his various capacities. This is a Swedish book written back in 1978 and I found it very inspiring. And in Swedish, that's Grave da du Stor, Dig Where You Stand. Now, this book was started a whole movement in Sweden. There are, in fact, with, during the 1980s, there were 10,000 Dig Where You Stand clubs. What were they about? Well, they were primarily small towns, industrial towns, rural communities needing some help, needing to mobilize themselves. And so this became a movement. Take charge of the problem yourself is a translation of that. Dig where you stand. Or look for the possibilities in your situation. And in the Swedish language, I also see dig where you stand. World domination starts here, right here in Pemberton. <coughs> Cultivate a dream. Dig where you stand. Whatever your project is, yes, right here in your village. So it was a project in Sweden. Uh, to re uh, revitalize small towns and rural areas, and uh, I found it very inspiring. It's also been translated into, in, uh, into French in Quebec, and dig where you stand is a very well-known phrase in rural Quebec as well, for all the same reasons. So, in talking about Pemberton in world history, I'm thinking like, wherever you are, whether it's Pemberton or Squamish or Darcy, dig where you stand. You can find something big, you can make something big right here. So, I'm going to start with the gold rush. Surely an international story. In fact, this is newspaper clippings from Melbourne, Australia, 1859. They had access, during the gold rush, newspapers right around the world were tapped into the Fraser River gold rush as it was happening. So, even we have the Bridge River gold latest from the Fraser, the Squamish River, and Pemberton. Almost immediately, this information was available in Melbourne, Australia, Hong Kong, London, England, of course, uh, all around the world. So the gold rush, uh, Fraser River gold rush, happened at a time when information about what was going on traveled through newsprint all around the world, all, right away. So. That is something that uh, is, uh, is quite interesting. And uh, here we have the, the a caribou, uh, the Quinell newspaper in 1867. Probable important discovery. It's hard to even consider a, any gold rush without some kind of information channel that's going to be working to distribute the, the knowledge. It isn't just word of mouth, the gold rush. In San Francisco, the Fraser River Gold Rush is written about in their newspapers. It was the newspapers that mobilized so many of those people to come here. And another thing that was going on during the Fraser River Gold Rush, photography 
both photography and newspapers were well established. And our BC gold rush is full of photo documentation, including this 1865 photo of Port Pemberton by the Italian Canadian photographer <coughs> Carlo Gentile. And so the gold rush we have is well documented in photographs. And that's also something we can consider alongside newspapers. So the next world story that Pemberton is a part of is the Klondike, I would suggest. There may be many stories that we can refer to, but I'm going to pick the Klondike as the next one. The Klondike and its marbles. This is from the world, the Vancouver newspaper in 1897. Alaska as a new railroad field is now beginning to attract attention because there's gold up there. By way of the Pemberton Meadows. Pemberton Meadows, you just can uh, go through the search engine for a, a, a newspaper like this. Every issue mentions the Pemberton Meadows at this time. Because it's how you're going to get up there to the Klondike. So, Pemberton Meadows, part of world history, part of the Klondike. Also because a lot of the people who came back from the Klondike, settled here. Charles Barber, the Ronans, at least some branches of the Ronan family, I'm not as familiar with it, I believe Jack Ronan came to Pemberton with Charles Barber. They both came down from the Klondike. So in that sense, Pemberton is a part of world history, part of the Klondike story. Another one, well here, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Barber and Child are at the Commercial Hotel in Vancouver. Mr. Barber has made considerable money in the north and now proposes going into the lumber business on the coast in Squamish, but he also bought a bunch of land here in Pemberton. We'll come back to that. Another story that is an international story that Pemberton and this valley is a part of is the growth of modern humanistic anthropology. Major achievements right here in, the, in this valley that are today standard references for anybody involved in the field of anthropology. Through, through two people, essentially. Franz Boas from Germany, who settled eventually in the United States, and here in 1894, spending several weeks among the Lillooet tribes right here in this valley. And he met up with James Tate. Last week, your guest speaker, Johnny Jones, mentions James Tate. Uh, a colleague, now Franz Boas, I should just mention, the first person to name these tribes accurately and their languages and make solid efforts to build a map and a, and a picture of these people and their languages and sort it all out. And uh, he was really a remarkable pioneer of this field of modern anthropology. And part of that story is right here in this valley. James Tate who married a woman from the Fraser Canyon, and his uh, association with Franz Boas is very close, and uh, he produced a number of works. This one was referred to by Johnny Jones last week here at the Pemberton Museum, The Lillooet Indians by James Tate, 1906, published with the assistance of Franz Boas with the Smithsonian Institution. It is a, it is a standard reference for anybody in the field. And another work by James Tate, Coiled Basketry in British Columbia and Surrounding Region, full of a collaboration, information that comes from local families in this valley. And this is a, a very famous book. You would have to spend several hundred dollars to acquire a copy, and, um, but it is a standard work on uh, uh, an inspiring work today in, in this field. So this is produced with the collaboration of families in this valley. Um, another world story that Pemberton is a part of, the Panama Canal. With no Panama Canal, nobody would be building a railway here to Pemberton. Farmers wouldn't be able to use any kind of railway. None would have been built because the railway and these investments all came about because of the Panama Canal. And looking forward to the Panama Canal as an opportunity to export our stuff, our uh, timber and, and other products back to the old country. And um, this is what justified primarily British but other investment also uh, in various kinds of facilities here in our part of the world in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Newport and this vision for uh, Squamish 
all to do with the Panama Canal. So Pemberton, very much a part of that story. And you can see even the railway line uh, on this map. The PGE, what became the PGE, this diagonal north-south line there, already on that. Part of the vision of the infrastructure that fits together with the Panama Canal. Here's another story, an international one, that is topical for our schools today. They're all learning about World War I. The Vimy Ridge battle earlier this spring was a topic for all of the schools in this corridor, probably. And what I regret is that they don't relate the story of World War I to us here. What took place here? Who was involved? And so I think this is a real challenge and something we need to do a much better job of, not only in schools, but when we celebrate Remembrance Day. Link, what are we doing here? Why are we talking about this, this stuff back in Europe? and we don't relate it to the local picture. Well, I found this very interesting. This is from the Vancouver World newspaper in 1918, and they've overlaid a map of the World War I area of northern France and Belgium over top of our southwest corner of BC. And I'll just read a little bit of this. A little northeast of Seton Lake, in relation to Vancouver in distance, Vancouver representing Paris, would be the slope of Vimy Ridge, where so many British Columbians fought and fell. Consider that millions of people fought and fell just within 50 miles of Seton Lake, if we were to superimpose that on a map of Europe. It's, it's an interesting thing to think about. And Pemberton. Pemberton here is representing Amiens. So the town of Amiens, railhead of the Allied forces, and one of the most important positions, so furiously fought over and unsuccessfully, uh, as far as the Germans are concerned, or the Germans in their last drive would occupy a place in the Pemberton Meadows. Look how close that is to Vancouver, to Paris. There is a marked contrast between the quasi-solitude of the Pemberton Meadows, where the silence is broken only a few times a week by the train going through to Clinton, and the uh, busy trains back and forth at Amiens, going back and forth to the front with troops and supplies and so on. But an interesting way to think about it and to relate us to this world story. Of course, there were Pemberton folks involved in the war in many ways. Horses were taken from this valley, put on boats, taken to Europe. And many kinds of involvement that we should do a better job of, of highlighting. So another story, a tragic one, the Spanish influenza. Immediately following the war, towards the end of it, special train, because our First Nations communities in this corridor were badly hit by the Spanish influenza. Everybody was. The doctors couldn't, were, were often uh, uh, affected. And so as is related here, Dr. Morley has been down with influenza himself, he was the one that was going to come up on the train to visit the villages here. And we can see in this other report all of these stories from the Vancouver World newspaper. 200 cases at Pemberton. That's part of a world story. Um, 40 deaths just to here in, in, in the local community in, in, in among the Little Wat people. The White Man's Curse, another one. So there's another world story that Pemberton is a part of. Another story I suggest that is a world story that's underappreciated is the school at Mount Curry. I remember I did some work up in Northwest BC with a representative for the Gicks and uh, Witsuwet'en during their trial and, and, and legal campaign, and he was a school teacher here. And he told me how he was so inspired to come to work at a school that was administered by Aboriginal people. He came all the way from Northwest BC to work here at Mount Curry at the DeSeal School. And I went in the Vancouver Public Library, and how do you find out about this school? You go to newspapers and newspaper clippings and all these files that are in the filing cabinet there. Someday, somebody, we all need to realize how precious that history is. Because that's where, it, that's where it is. It's nowhere else other than in people's memories. But that's where it's preserved, and that's how it's preserved the story of that, that school 
at Mount Curry that was so inspirational right across the country. It was such a pioneering project of, of the local community taking, taking charge of their, of their program. Another international story. We all have our different sides and, and involvements in it and relationships to it, but I suggest that the Stein Valley campaign is an international story that Pemberton is a part of. Just one, another example. John Denver uh, came up here. <laughs> David Suzuki and, and, and who knows how many other of, the, of these uh, well-known people would come up here and, and be involved in this international story that took place here. And there have been, of course, many like it around BC, but the Stein Valley back is into the 70s and into the 80s. I remember attending down at the Mount Curry Rodeo Arena, a Stein Valley concert for Stein Valley and so on. John Denver wasn't at that one, but there were plenty other celebrities. So I suggest that uh, it's interesting to think about uh, these, uh, it, uh, how Pemberton in world history, I'm not making it up, I think it's true. I think we can think about Pemberton or any small place as part of world history. We each have our moments. Now here's a more recent uh, episode of world history. The largest landslide in the history of Canada happened here in this valley. But what's, why I, I bring this up and I close these, uh, this list of world stories that Pemberton is a part of, what is interesting here is that you wouldn't go to newspapers to learn about it in future. You'll be looking for film footage, YouTube videos, photographs, but not newspapers. And that's the difference than from before. Now, my mother has saved all of the Vancouver Sun and the Squamish Citizen and the Squamish Times newspaper articles about our silver thaw that we had in 1972. A tremendous natural event and catastrophe, if you like, and spectacular one that happened in the winter of 1972. And if you go to those newspaper pages today, they're very informative. The photos are great. It's a complete picture of what happened. But I would suggest that no newspaper did that kind of a job for this event. And that just indicates the changing role of newspapers. Regrettably, but I think things move on. So we, we have new media that we're going to have to sort our way about when we come back to write the history of these things. Uh, 1970s, as this was being compiled by the local ladies, they went to four newspapers as what they refer to as their framework. And news these newspapers are still a framework for history. They went to the Bridge River Lillooet News, the Squamish Times, the Vancouver Sun, and the Vancouver Province. They didn't go to the World, which existed between 1894 and 1924, because it wasn't available. The World in 1924 was purchased by the Sun. And the archive copies, well, they just weren't accessible when this book was being put together. So, uh, The World was established in 1894, and it quickly became one of the premier newspapers of British Columbia. And um, one of the interesting things about it is that uh, under two successive manage management uh, regimes, um, they were essentially managed by women. So, Sarah McLaughlin was the wife of the original publisher editor. He passed on early. She took over the newspaper, but later sold to L.D. Taylor, who was in several, on several occasions a mayor of Vancouver, so a politician, as well as being a newspaper man. Uh, but his partner, Alice, they weren't married, but they were partners. Alice really was the manager of the newspaper. And the other thing unique about the world, among the other newspapers that was in, uh, in Vancouver at the time, there were four of them, the News Advertiser, the Province, the Sun, and the World, is that the world had no political affiliation. They were sort of liberal, leftish, pinkish, if you like, independent, populist. And the reason for that is that L.D. Taylor came up from the States and he wasn't a part of the Vancouver establishment. Whereas the Sun and the Province and the News Advertiser, these people were senior politicians, senators, and so on, business people. The other thing that's unique about the world as a newspaper is that it didn't have the backing of a railway company. The province was, this, was the CPR's paper. The Sun, uh, after 1912, it was the newspaper of the PGE. Mr. Uh, J.W. Stewart purchased the Sun in 1912 to promote his railway. 
the CPR kept a handle on the province to make sure that its, its interests were brought forward to the public. This was the world of newspapers back then. The province was a conservative newspaper. The Sun was liberal. So L.D. Taylor was an interesting character, and a very prominent BC historian has written a book about him. And uh, he was uh, a, a mayor of Vancouver on several occasions, several short, ter short terms during the period of Vancouver's spectacular growth before the World War I years. And what is also interesting is that this period of the world coincides with the heyday of the newspaper. The, when the newspaper trans, transitioned, or these types of newspapers, from being, journal, from being uh, journals of advocacy for railway companies or political parties, to more popular journals that were more professional to make money. To make money, you had to appeal to anyone, not just this political party or this company. And so the world was what, the first newspaper that really broke ground in that way. It became a newspaper of the people, for the people, in order to survive, because he didn't have that backing that the other newspapers had. So that's a little bit of background about the world and uh, other interesting things about it concerning Pemberton that we'll come to. The world, uh, L.D. Taylor, also built this building. The world was purchased by the Sun newspaper, and it became the headquarters of the Sun well into probably the 50s or 60s, it's still there today. And at one time, the tallest office building in the British Empire. And so, there's two things I'd like to discuss relative to these newspaper clippings I've harvested from the archives of the world. First of all, what old newspapers reveal for historians? First of all, big schemes of the metropolis, Vancouver, for the hinterland, the Pemberton Valley. I think this is really important. Uh, who's behind what the, uh, these editorials have to say about what should happen up here, what should happen with the railway, and so on? Here's an example. This is an editorial from the world in 1891. A rich inheritance, British Columbians and Vancouverites in particular, just beginning to realize that they have a glorious inheritance of vast empire of possibilities of resources. The Vancouver Northern and Peace River and Alaska line will open up the richest section of the province. It's going to come through the Pemberton Meadows. It will extend from the southern to the northeastern, and so on. The value of such a line to the city of Vancouver and New Westminster cannot be overestimated. That's what's in the forefront of their thinking. Not what the value of this railway is going to be for the Pembroke Meadows. It's what the value of this is going to be for the metropolis, for us here in the city. And that is a one perspective. So, we have here uh, the application to incorporate a railway scheme, the Vancouver Northern and Alaska Railway and Navigation Company, in 1890, one of the first ones that was to come through here and by way of Pemberton Meadows. And uh, here in, uh, uh, so th that, that scheme essentially resources to bring them through Vancouver to benefit Vancouver and businesses in Vancouver. In August 1990, something that a lot of us in forestry also in the forest industry are not really aware of is how soon and to what extent our forest landscape was in the control of Americans already by 1890. Here, where we are today, Mr. Slot from Michigan bought up all the timber for miles around all the way down to the top end of Harrison Lake, bought it for next to nothing already by 1890. Same in Squamish. Marilyn Ring, also from Michigan, bought up the entire eastern side of the Squamish Valley from the Stuamas River all the way up to Brome Lake was in American hands, 25 cents an acre by 1890. We forget that, and lots happened since then. What happened here was Mr. Slot passed away a few years later, and as an entrepreneur, didn't get a chance to realize his schemes. He was going to build a mill down in Steveson and so on. But it's, it's, uh, it shows you that we're part of a hinterland and what's going on you have to go back to the newspapers and piece it together. Because we who grew up here, we aren't even aware, not only of the schemes of the past, but the schemes of the present sometimes too. So newspapers are useful to go back to piece together this story. 
of, of how things took shape, the infrastructure, the investments, the policies, and whose interests. 1891, when completed, the trade of Pemberton Meadows and the country tributary thereto will be transacted in Vancouver. That was the most important thing. So, the, the potatoes, you know, Pemberton Valley was recognized way back, 1860s, as a serious prospect for an agricultural uh, produce. Um, but uh, the schemes to deliver that, to bring it about, always in the interest of the metropolis, the city, and the people there. 1892, North Vancouver, a lateral or feeder road up Seymour Creek, heading for the Lillooet country in the Great Pemberton Meadows, will of course benefit the North Shore. Will pour traffic into Vancouver's lap. <laughs> so, this, the harbor is the outlet for this harbor, North Vancouver, is the harbor for all the outlet of the country known as the Pemberton Meadows, the District of Lillooet, the Chilcotin. The Vancouver Northern Peace River and Alaska Railway is going to deliver to us here in North Vancouver. 1893. Now, there's a very interesting fellow that came to BC from uh, via Ontario, from Ireland, uh, in the gold rush, William Shannon, after whom Shannon Falls is named. And he's one of these people that because he didn't have any male, uh, his, his, he had his, a son who passed on or, uh, be, uh, before he did, and so there's nobody really remembers William Shannon. You have to go back in the newspapers to see what he was involved with, the scope of his activity. And William Shannon had a profound impact on Squamish and on Pemberton. It was William Shannon that brought those guys from Michigan up here. And his motivations, he was also an agriculturalist, um, very much into the hops growing, got the hops industry going here in this part of the world. Um, so his motivations are, are not so much the schemer of the metropolis, but because uh, he was a farmer at heart. But he is an example of somebody, first of all, we really have to dig to find out about him today. He's really forgotten, but his influence. So the, William Shannon in 1893 called a meeting together in this office in Vancouver, his real estate company, specializing in farmland and timberland, to sort out what was going to happen with Pemberton organized the place. What, what was it ready for? It needed a road. I'll go over to Victoria and I'll see about that. William Shannon in those early days had a profound influence on the development, the plans for this part of the world, for, for Pemberton and several other communities, uh, and not least Squamish as well. So uh, all communications relative to the matter of Pemberton and what was going to happen here should be referred to 623 Hastings Street, the office of William Shannon. Here's William Shannon in his Chilliwack farming days. So his later office uh, was in the Flack building in Victory Square. He was there for many years. I went to visit it last week and it's a, a coffee shop. <laughs> I wanted to relive, you know, the office the atmosphere and whatnot, but it's, uh, it's all a, a coffee shop on that, down, on that floor there. But, he had enormous influence over this part of the world from, from offices like this, William Shannon and his, his real estate partners. Now, in 1889, he wrote a, a book about British Columbia, introducing it to investors, to settlers. 10,000 copies sold in Britain in 1889, 1890. And it's the first time that there's a proper chapter describing the Pemberton Meadows, ever really, to settlers and investors. And so, um, this is part of the thing you have to, we, we're thankful for old newspapers for, to, so that we can put this story together. 1901, letters dealing with matters of public interest, the People's Parliament, I've mentioned that the world newspaper tried to be popular, populist, the, pe the, the, the working, working man's newspaper. So, here's a letter here, it is easily seen what interests the province newspaper and what it is advocating. It is certainly not the people's. Then it must be the interests of the CPR. So um, this was part of the world of newspapers back then. They, were, they, were, they had this baggage with them. 
Um, here, I think I'm closing off on this, uh, this theme, but here we have L.D. Taylor, who at the time was mayor of Vancouver. L.D. Taylor, the subject of Mr. Francis's book here, and this is his editorial. What does it profit Vancouver, this PGE railway? Let's sort it out here. If we, if we get the Second Arrows Bridge going on, we could really benefit from this PGE Railway. Otherwise, what's it good for? We'll bring Vancouver into touch with great country awaiting development. So now I'd like to turn to another theme as we go back and look at how Pemberton Meadows is treated in these newspaper stories in the world during the early decades of the last century. And that is... They are also a record of community life and development. And the case here, the Pemberton Valley. And so newspapers are a wonderful source, and the authors of this book, of course, have used them heavily, in addition to their own you know, oral and, and, and memories and so on, and local records. But that's what newspapers are great for, and especially when, uh, in former times, I would say that they're not, that that's not what newspapers are today. We have other, other um, venues for that today. But as a record of community life. And here, October 19, 1890, a very nice description. And it's not from a schemer or an investor. But it's just an honest appraisal of this wonderful valley. And uh, the Upper Lillooet. So when you do your search, you, you don't always use Pemberton, you use Upper Lillooet, and there's various combinations, and we, we're going to be digging for a while. This is only recently available to us, this ability to do these, to do these searches. So uh, this is a, uh, a, cent a future center of wealth and industry, but it's somebody writing from the perspective of, of a settler. Here, uh, lots of uh, different kinds of information about the Pemberton Meadows back in 1893, including real estate information. Pemberton Meadows, 120 acres at $7 an acre. And that is 1893. And we'll see as the decades go, and I could have loaded up a number of slides of the different real estate advertisements to, tr to trace this up and down of real estate prices here for uncleared or cleared land. Uh, but at any rate, 120 acres, $7 per acre. And in 1896, we have 120 acres of this meadow land for sale at $2 per acre. Pemberton Meadows. And that's uh, nice with the search engines that you can find all kinds of pockets of the newspaper where Pemberton will, will, will be treated in gray space. And here we go. Is uh, the Pemberton Meadows Cattle Company in 1896 had an office right across the street from the Hotel Vancouver. <laughs> and this is what they're offering. They will deliver meat anywhere in the city at the following prices. Boiling beef at five cents per pound, and so on. Steaks, sirloin, roast beef, mutton, the very best. Pork, veal. So already in 1896, this distribution organized, and we have no railway yet. This must have been quite a, an enterprise. Of course, Vancouver, a much smaller place at that time, but these, these folks are right across the street, right in the center of town, right across the street from the Hotel Vancouver on, on Granville Street, Granville and Georgia. So, another uh, article uh, just to give us a, an idea of what's going on here, what people are thinking about the valley and recollecting as well. Pemberton really is older than Canada. We talk about 150 years of Canada, but Pemberton goes back earlier, just in its modern, you know, post-contact uh, development. 1864, so Mr. Holbrook is saying, that's nothing, we figured out Pemberton decades ago. You know, I've known about Pemberton for 30, 40 years. <laughs> and that's true. There's already two, three generations of people by this time that are well aware of the Pemberton Meadows and its potential. Even in those days, the Pemberton Meadows were under survey, and many districts were well known that many of our newcomers imagined have been found only in recent years. So this is debates of the legislature in uh, 1902, and the cause is a road. The settlers want a road through Squamish. Well, 
okay, Harrison Lake too was still in contention. Um, but this guy in the government, uh, in those estimates, uh, spending estimates debates, he says the place was only fit for a penal colony. He would not even condemn the opposition in the legislature to go and live there. So there's no justification for investing in a road to Pemberton. <laughs> now, here in 1905 is probably the earliest big splash of Pemberton on the front page, just a big feature on Pemberton Meadows. I would venture to say this is probably the earliest, and it's quite interesting. We'll look into a couple of sections of it. You can see that's the front page of the Sunday World Magazine section. Pemberton Meadows, a land of sunshine and flowers, the gem of Vancouver's hinterland. <laughs> what Pemberton has, and you can bet there's some local settlers here that have had a hand in helping out this, these articles. What Pemberton has is 45,000 acres of the finest land that li lies out of doors. One billion feet of the most valuable timber, the bog iron ledges in Western Canada, copper prospects, water power, navigable river, cattle ranges, a climate that cannot be beaten in Italy, <laughs> and scenery that discounts Switzerland. A natural game preserve that is not equal to anywhere else in America. <laughs> so what Pemberton wants, settlers, a railway, a survey, a sane assessment, <laughs> development of timber, development of water power, waterways made available for navigation, a registered office moved to Vancouver from Victoria, the country properly advertised, and its iron and copper resources properly placed before the world by government inspection and report. So, one of the interesting things about these old newspapers, the world anyway, is that you have who's who at staying at the hotels. And you can watch the scheming going on, and who's doing lobbying over in Victoria, because the, the boat traffic too the, is also kept track of. Not only what ship you're taking over to Victoria, what schedule and what hotel you're staying at, but also the conversations. So, Mr. Medill, Mr. Galbraith and his daughter, and Mr. McGee from Squamish are at the Dominion Hotel in Vancouver. And this reporter is dropping by for gossip and what they have to say is that there is such a great deal of travel through the valley at present because of the attraction of the Pemberton Meadows. Now, some more real estate ads. Here we are in 1908, so we're just coming to the railway investment time. And the house sound in Northern is well underway as a, as a concern and preparing to lay down track shortly. 1,800 acres of first-class land in one block in the Pemberton Meadows will almost undoubtedly be the first town of any importance after leaving Vancouver, says Charles Barber of Squamish, who owns a lot of land up here with his Klondike gold mine. Charles Barber, as it turns out, was quite a force at this time, and it's something, as we'll find later, uh, he didn't, couldn't pass on his farm to anyone. And so you have to go back, inevitably, to newspapers to discover his story and the story of his influence here. New Railway files its plans. Of course, this is the House on Pemberton Meadows in Northern, or the House Sound in Northern, as it came to be called. And this is an extremely important uh, chapter in our regional history that uh, can't be overemphasized, is that uh, when they began to build that railway, um, they, it was going to be a pay-as-you-go. They weren't going to build more than they could afford. They were going to pay for it through the sale of the timber that was, was surrounding it. So that it, was, it was going to be done in a, in a, well, not in some wild scheme to get up to Alaska and, and promise to do that in five years. But uh, at the time, this was such an expansive, optimistic period in British Columbia's history and economy up to 1912. And we were all just overtaken by it, all the politicians in Victoria. And they went with the other people, the PGE, another category or another uh, group of investors who had these wild schemes and big promises. They were connected to the Grand Trunk Pacific, and the government simply opted for them instead of these folks, which in hindsight was a disaster. So what their plan was, that they could not see the necessity of expending a couple of million dollars to construct some 40 miles of difficult road, roadway down, the, down through House Sound. House Sound's like that. 
Why not just use Squamish as your port, as your outlet for the Pemberton Meadows? And that will enable every foot of the line to be put through through revenue-producing territory. So mines, they were active in, in developing mines as well as timber, and that was going to pay for the railway. And they would go along that way. Anderson Lake, from that point, water transportation is available to a large territory. So why not just stick with what's here and what's available? And there's lots of things to do, lots of money to be made. So these were different types of investors. They were an older generation of, of BC entrepreneurs that were behind the house on the Northern Railway. And it is probably very unfortunate that it was not them that were, was to get the, get the opportunity to continue with that railway enterprise. Instead, it was handed over to another group. So back to the real estate advertisements for Pemberton. Now we're up to $8 per acre, but it will soon be worth from 40 to 50 because the railway is coming. And uh, Albo von Albensleben is uh, the fellow behind the Wigwam Inn up in Indian Arm, and he was later, shortly, to be accused of being a German spy once the war broke out, and he lost all of his holdings here, but he was quite a mover and shaker in Vancouver, and uh, affiliated with the German uh, Emperor, or German Kaiser, uh, and uh, lots of German investment here at that time, including here in Pemberton. 1909. 1910. Uh, this firm of investors have made a speculation in Pemberton Meadows and placed some fine land on the market yesterday. $30 to $100 per acre. So we're getting to real speculation here now. And it's all to do with the railway. The house sound Pemberton Valley and Northern. Pemberton Valley land sells freely. Big demand. $25 to $125 an acre. Wanted land in Pemberton Meadows will buy land up to 500 acres. We would like preference to land near the house sound in northern town site today's town site or near the survey of the Grand Trunk Pacific because there's two rival companies wanting to build a line through here. The Grand Trunk Pacific, those are the people behind the PGE, and eventually they won out. There's two survey crews going here forward and. Um, they were going to build down through the, up the Seymour and down the Stuamis um, to get here. So a railway through Pemberton Meadows, we predict, and so on and so forth. This is the House Sound and Northern Development Company. Now they have, there's their surveyors back in 1906, 1907 have figured out how you get through the Chequemus Canyon. You cross it at a certain place and come back over there, you get around this rock and so on. They sorted it out and that was a major obstacle. And once they did that, they thought, now we buy up all the land we can in Pemberton and at the waterfront in Squamish. Don't tell anybody yet. <laughs> and so the House Sound and Northern, who are locals in the city of Vancouver, North, North, North Shore investors, old timers have been around a while. And um, they uh, bought up a lot of land in Pemberton and they held it for quite a while. So we'll see a number of real estate ads from, from, from these folks going to inspect the Temp Pemberton Meadows, well as Mr. Charles Barber organizing a tour of Vancouver people to come up here and have a look at the lands that he's got for sale. Many settlers for Pemberton Meadows in 1911 were still in the boom period. Scotch settlers, highly desirable. John Mackenzie is an agent for Charles Barber. He ran a store on Charles Barber's property, which is down where the trailer park is there, just uh, to, up, up the valley a ways. Uh, induced to purchase holdings in the Pemberton Meadows through reports sent back by a well-known Scotch resident of that locality. I'm not sure who that might have been. Barber was Scottish via uh, New Brunswick, so somebody else in the picture, maybe Mackenzie. Now, these Scottish investors, yes, they were back in Scotland, and they were investing here. They invested in Squamish, too. Sight unseen in Squamish during the Newport heyday, they all kinds of land was subdivided. Some of it today is where the rivers ran through. It was swamp. Or behind our house on, on Hospital Hill in Squamish, it's got a 50 foot cliff like this right in the middle of the lot. So this was a bit of a notorious, notorious thing because these Scottish folks who came over to report back home, they were furious. And they went to the provincial government, they complained everywhere they could. But what was going on here? These speculators that had ripped them off, selling them land that was obviously quite useless. 
Any, at any rate, that's a little bit of a side story to the Newport era, was these, these, uh, this connection to Scottish, Scottish investors. But it was a boom period. It was just one of these boom periods where things like that happened. So by now, in 1912, the provincial government is saying, we're going to push all the way to the peace. Who's going to build a line all the way to the peace? We have to develop that part of the country too. And so that just added to the, to the speculation. And you can, it's now the, all the real estate ads for the Pemberton Meadows are all referring to the Peace River country too. The famous Peace River scheme will develop no richer district than Pemberton Meadows. The Rich Valley and so on and so forth. Now long ago, when the present site of Vancouver was a virgin forest, Enormous crops were grown in the Pemberton Meadows to supply the miners in the Caribou District. Well, to some extent, I'm not sure about enormous crops, but potatoes yield 20 tons per acre and so on and so forth. So this is again the House Sound and Northern Development Company. Their ads really take a turn now. They just go for it in their gusto because they were the losers. They've already, it was a forced sale of their railway privileges to the PGE group. And so now they just got their land holdings left and they're just gonna do what they can with them. And you can, it's all reflected in their ads. So they're no longer in the railway business, but they're still in the real estate business, both in Pepperton and Lillooet and down in, in Squamish. So another house on a Northern Development Company, Pemberton Meadows important notice, Peace River Railway, prices going up, purchase this week. Sheltered from winds, the Pemberton Meadows, with a great depth of soil and watered by the upper Lillooet River, the growth of all vegetation in the Pemberton Meadows is semi-tropical. And Vancouver people, instead of going to California, will winter in Lillooet. Now we come to uh, the settlers here in the valley and the PGE, now an operating, operating the railway and have brought it to uh, are just about here at Pemberton, uh, probably up by Summit Lake, Alta Lake by now, and uh, I think it's a little bit later in the year that they arrive here, and already they're going to the government and saying, you know, we've got all these people coming to us and they, they want to get up to that Pemberton Valley, so we need to be able to do what we need to do to get, be able to bring settlers up there. We've, they're asking our company for transportation. That's also true for Mountaineers and sort of early tourist lodges already mobilizing around this railway. It's, uh, I think it's important to understand that tourism alongside logging is one of our oldest industries. All, all because that access was available through the, through the railway. Valley residents want line open. So here in 1916, during the First World War, snow. The settlers in that district, this district, have depended entirely on the PGE since the old trails out of commission. You want to know the particulars of the subsidy that was given to the PGE folks to build a wagon road because we're really in trouble here. Even among the white settlers, supplies have had to be divided up and if the Indians had not prepared for a hard winter and a possible tie-up of transportation facilities, really in hardship. Um, because that, this snowstorm, this winter conditions, um, so, uh, now we're, we're looking at uh, news and reports from life in the valley and uh, a growing settlement and now selling potatoes, shipping them via uh, car by carload, arrived consigned to a company in, the, in Vancouver and the spuds shown fine quality was sell for $80 a ton in the Vancouver market. And uh, we have here Mr. Davis, who later was the proprietor of the Pemberton Hotel, I believe, uh, he's a war veteran coming here looking for a home site. These are just bits of news. During the 1920s, the world had a regular Pemberton Meadows column with local news, every issue. So we have all of this information that will be very important for local history writers here in future. The first tractor tested in Mr. Barber's property. Uh, last of the potatoes being shipped by Barber and Dermody down to the city. Better mail service desired. Laying out Pemberton town site in 1920. 
Mr. Taylor has left for Vancouver to lobby for the returned soldiers and they're interested in better mail service for the Upper Valley. And log cabins going to lumber structures for new buildings in the Valley. 1920. So, there are in, in this book there are a number of interesting stories about a local character, Pete Peterson, a Danish immigrant. And he finally gets to enjoy his first train ride, got all dressed up for it. And uh, it'll be interesting uh, uh, to, for folks that, that know or can piece together other stories of these people. And they can be complemented by new material, new information from the world newspaper. Cottonwood. Now, I hope you'll excuse my indulgence being from a forestry uh, uh, interest uh, in, but it, it appears to me in looking through the world that your first logging industry really was centered around cottonwood. And uh, this is a very interesting thing to follow. Cottonwood was used extensively at the present time as pulp for paper making and other uses in Westminster. Built a partnership with the people from the Little Watt community to do the logging, they were to do the logging, and they built up this cottonwood industry during the 1920s. Now, we have here in 1920, ah, this is a, a July 1st celebration. And I won't re read it through, but it's just a really, uh, it indicates a community that's thriving. There's two organizations doing a lot of the work, the veterans, uh, uh, folks representing the returned soldiers and the, the Farmers Union chapter here in Pemberton. Those two organizations all through the 20s seem to be uh, doing the heavy, heavy lifting and representing the community and uh, drawing people together. And this is a July 1st celebration that uh, is really a nice story about, uh, uh, you can almost put, a, put a, a, a nice painting beside this story about a community getting together for July 1st. Ah, the mining going on uh, with the Barbers and the Ronins up in the, on the, uh, in the Tankiel area. Uh, and uh, Mr. Charles Barber of Egerton has lost over $2,000 worth of horses and cattle through their eating poisonous roots or herbs. Little tidbits like this. And something that's interesting is there seems to be a long-standing tradition of local settlers, local farmers, in mountaineering, going way back. This photo is, in fact, of, of local farmers, Ronan, I believe, in the photo. Um, their annual after haying mountain climb. And about 20 with packs and grub for a four days outing left for Sphinx Mountain. So this is documented in these community reports, local farmers doing mountaineering. And in 1920 here, their first uh, participation in the uh, agricultural ex exhibitions in Vancouver. There were two at New Westminster and at Vancouver. Eventually, they kind of consolidated at New Westminster, then that came back to the PE in uh, probably, I think, the 1940s. But the first presentation of Pemberton produce in Vancouver here in 1920. And ranchers who are up to date in their ideas and believe in the value of publicity. Good on them. And a number of the returned soldier settlers who suffered much real hard work this summer when the river was high. So this is outlining concerns regarding flooding and a campaign over years and years to get some action on that front. Back to Cottonwood, they're going to float it down the river to Harrison Lake. And uh, a very, it uh, seems that in the end, quite a successful project. And again, a partnership with the folks in the Little Walk community. They, they were going to do the logging because they were ready to do it at that time of year. And um, so they had ready buyers down in New Westminster. And Jack Andrews from the reserve here was contracted for removal of the cottonwood. And uh, they were floated it down the river. There you have a picture from this operation. So this went on for several years. And evidently a very successful industry. Big Water Hall for small logs planned to deliver cottonwood to Vancouver via Fraser River and Harrison Lake. The transportation of cot or cottonwood logs by the water route from Pemberton to the Fraser is considered by some to be a doubtful undertaking. Lack of equipment to handle the heavy logs in the deep snow. A tentative arrangement with the Little Walk community. Men employed in the new industry 
picking cottonwood buds, another sideline, for medicinal purposes. And tapping fir trees for the pitch, which is made into turpentine and other products. So it's interesting to read about these little sideline industries that were going on in the 1920s. Uh, this Lower Lillooet Lakes, the scheme for river control for the Lower Valley. Cut every cottonwood in Pemberton Meadows. <laughs> Mr. Jack Andrews from, from the Reserve, who had the contract and so on. So, concerns about the railway. Because the CPR rates were cheaper than the PGE. And that was a, a matter of uh, concern to, to the shippers from here. And lots of lobbying concerning that over years. In fact, it's still going on. And a sad story, the 16-year-old son of Mr. and Mrs. Charles Barber, uh, a gun accident, taken to Squamish on the PGE gas speeder, where he caught the boat to Vancouver, and unfortunately died. So that was who might have taken over that Barber farm. He had, they had two daughters as well. Uh, they were at school, and they relocated elsewhere. I think uh, Reba to Washington State, and the other daughter to the Lower Mainland. Now, I don't know the connection, whether this is the Barber Farm that's spoken about here, but Pemberton Meadow is owing to serious accident, a sale. The owner, we are instructed to 200 acres, and it's a, evidently a very highly developed farm here. And whether that sale was followed through or not, I'm not sure. Anyway, the Barbers did stay for some time, but they were soon to be uh, finishing their careers here in Pemberton. But that was a sad time for them, obviously. And uh, here, the success of the transportation of the Cottonwood Lodge from the Pemberton Meadows by the water route. Every reason to believe they'll pass the danger point at the Skookum Chuck. And uh, so they're floating just fine. And in fact, two logs side by side, they had an enormous winch that was put into play there. And their main problem was being hung up on the brush on the riverbanks. Pemberton potatoes shipped to Vancouver. And just another, just about conditions here. Dr. Paul of Squamish hurriedly summoned for another accident, rushed the injured boy to Squamish on a speeder, where he was put on board the boat. So that's quite a, some set of logistics uh, in, in, in such circumstances. Dr. Paul served the corridor for many years. Pemberton United Farmers Association produced a pamphlet. And this is the last slide I have, I, 1924, the last year of the world newspapers. And today's grocery specials. It doesn't tell me what company or who's doing this distribution, but Pemberton potatoes are the potatoes in, in, in Vancouver. In, in I've several ads like this, it's, they are only referring to P Pemberton potatoes. And they are fancy grade A potatoes from Pemberton per sack at $2.25. And every grocery list in all through all these newspapers for Vancouver. So uh, we've only just begun to take advantage of the tools that we have and the digitalization work that is still ongoing. And we can look forward in future to the province in particular for our early decades, or uh, was you know the primary, premier newspaper uh, for British Columbia, really. Later on, the, of course, the Vancouver Sun. Eventually, they will be digitalized, and we'll have uh, it'll, for crazy people like me. <laughs> uh, we'll have all have opportunity to explore a new new layers of history, and uh, new discoveries about the big schemes and about the little things that were going on between families and down the street and local businesses that will all be available through newspapers. And I thank you very much for your interest. Oh, thank you.